Urartu, also known as the Kingdom of Urartu or the Kingdom of Van, was a civilization that thrived during the Bronze and Iron Age in ancient Armenia, eastern Turkey, and northwestern Iran, starting from the 9th century BCE. The kingdom controlled its territories through military strength and the construction of fortresses. It was known for its vibrant artistic production, especially in metalwork. Despite its relatively short existence of only two centuries, the kingdom vanished mysteriously in the 6th century BCE and was rediscovered as a distinct ancient culture through excavations conducted in the 19th century CE. The historical knowledge of Urartu remains incomplete due to a lack of extensive written records, relying heavily on potentially biased sources from contemporary enemy states like Assyria. However, surviving inscriptions, architecture, and artifacts, along with ongoing archaeological investigations, have allowed researchers to reconstruct a sufficiently detailed history, revealing the significant influence of this ancient culture in the region. The name Urartu comes from the Assyrian word Urashtu, meaning high place, possibly referring to the mountainous region or the practice of building fortifications on rocky outcrops. The Babylonians referred to them as Uruatri, and in Hebrew, the kingdom was known as Ararat. The Urartians called themselves Bayina, and their state was called Bayanili or Land of the Nairi. Urartu originated from a confederation of kingdoms that had developed from the 14th or 13th century BCE. A recognizable and independent state of Urartu emerged in the 9th century BCE, likely as a response to a threat from Assyria. The civilization flourished due to its settlement on a vast fertile plateau well supplied with rivers. They cultivated various crops, including wheat, barley, millet, rye, sesame, and flax. Viticulture was also significant, and the region may have been one of the earliest centers for winemaking. Fruits like plums, apples, cherries, quinces, and pomegranates were also found at Urartu sites. Animal husbandry thrived with excellent mountain pastures, and they raised sheep, goats, cattle, and horses. The region also had valuable mineral deposits, including gold, silver, copper, lead, iron, and tin. Being strategically located on trade routes between the ancient Mediterranean, Asian, and Anatolian cultures contributed to their prosperity. Despite being protected by mountains in the north and south, Urartu needed constant defense against potential attackers from the east and west, eager to seize the region's wealth. The government of Urartu operated as a centralized monarchy with a close circle of advisors and a larger group of civil administrators responsible for overseeing construction projects, temples, roads, and canals. The fortress capital, Tushpa, situated on the eastern shores of Lake Van, was later known as Van. At its peak, Van possibly had a population of around 50,000 people. The capital also featured a royal necropolis with chambers cut into the mountain. Other surviving structures include an open-air shrine with inscriptions on smooth rock walls. The provinces were governed by regional governors who represented the king, administered justice, and collected taxes in kind, which were then sent back to the capital. The earliest known Urartian monarch was Arame, who reigned around 860 to 840 BCE. The kingdom rose to prominence around 830 BCE under King Sarduri I, and his descendants ruled for the next two centuries. In 776 BCE, King Argishti I founded the city of Argishtianili, later renamed Armavir, on the plain of Ararat. Around 685 BCE, King Rusa II founded the significant northern city of Teshibaini, modern-day Yerevan. Other important Urartian centers included Bastam, Karmir Blur, Adilkavas, and Aeonis. The kingdom controlled extensive agricultural areas through annual military campaigns and a network of fortresses. The rulers sometimes formed confederations with weaker neighboring tribes and extracted tribute in the form of goods and slaves instead of outright conquest. Nonetheless, there were instances of capturing slaves during campaigns, like Argishti's campaigns against the Hatti and Sop. By the 7th century BCE, Urartu controlled territory from the Caspian Sea to the upper Euphrates, and from the Caucasus Mountains in the north to the Taurus Range in the south. However, the exact extent of their territory is still a subject of debate among scholars. In terms of warfare, all Urartian kings were actively involved in leading their armies. They used weapons such as iron and bronze swords, spears, javelins, and bows. Their heavy shields had large central bosses adorned with images of mythical creatures, bulls, and lions. Evidence also suggests the use of helmets and metal scale armor, mainly worn by the elite. The primary adversary of Urartu was the Neo-Assyrian Empire, although trade relations between the two states also existed. Given the fame of the Urartians for horse breeding, it is reasonable to assume they may have used chariots, similar to the Assyrians. While Urartu enjoyed some victories in the mid-8th century BCE, they faced significant challenges during the reigns of Tiglath-Pileser III and Sargon II of Assyria. Other enemies of Urartu included the Sumerians, Scythians, and eventually the Medes. In the religion of Urartu, various offerings and sacrifices were made to the gods in dedicated outdoor ritual spaces and at gates to the gods, which were false doorways carved into rock faces. 
These offerings included food, weapons, precious goods, libations of wine, and animal sacrifices. The pantheon of the Urartian religion consisted of a mix of unique gods and deities borrowed from the Hurrian culture. For instance, the god of storms and thunder was Teshiba, derived from the Hurrian god Shub. In the mid-9th century BCE, King Ishpwini elevated Haldi, also known as Kaldi, a deity of foreign origin, to the head of the gods. Haldi's exact role and function remain somewhat unclear, but he was strongly associated with warfare and was often depicted as a man standing on a bull or lion, symbolizing his power. Temples were dedicated to Haldi, characterized by their distinctive square towers with reinforced corners. Haldi's significance was so immense that the Urartians were sometimes referred to as the children of Haldi, and the ruling king was known as the servant of Haldi. All wars were conducted in his name. Another significant deity was Shivani, the sun god. He was often represented with a winged solar disk, likely inspired by the Egyptian god Ra, who also had similar associations. Arubani, the consort of Haldi, held great importance as the principal female goddess. Other important goddesses included Silardi, the moon goddess, and Sardi, a goddess associated with stars. The symbol of the tree of life, which was common in Mesopotamian cultures, was also present in Urartian art. This symbol was usually depicted with a figure on each side making offerings. Overall, the religion of Urartu was characterized by a diverse pantheon of gods, including both indigenous and borrowed deities, and elaborate rituals involving offerings and sacrifices to honor and appease these divine beings. The Urartians were known for their impressive architecture and ambitious construction projects. One of their significant achievements was the construction of an 80-kilometer-long stone-lined canal that brought fresh water from the Ardos Mountains to their capital city, Tushpa. This canal, built by King Menua, allowed the city to flourish with vineyards and orchards, earning it a reputation as a garden city. While few structures have survived to this day, a relief in the palace of the Assyrian king Sargon provides an example of an Urartian temple. The relief depicts the temple of Haldi at Ardini before it was attacked by the Assyrians in 714 BCE. The temple featured a hexastyle portico with a triangular pediment, shields hanging from the exterior walls, and large urns on each side of the entrance. One of the best preserved fortresses of Urartu can be found at Erebani, near today's capital of Armenia, Yerevan. This fortress, built during the reign of King Argishti I, boasts impressive sections of fortification walls that have endured through the ages. Typical Urartian fortifications included massive walls with stone foundations made of large square blocks and supported by towers. These towers were often crenellated and had windows, as seen in Assyrian reliefs depicting Urartian fortifications. The remarkable survival of these fortifications, despite the region being prone to powerful earthquakes, attests to the exceptional building skills of the Urartians. The palace buildings of Urartu were designed with multiple chambers and larger halls. The roofs of smaller chambers were supported by a central wooden column, while larger halls had multiple rows of columns for support. The palaces also featured open courtyards and storerooms where large pottery jars were embedded into the floor to store foodstuffs, wine, and beer. Some of these jars could hold up to 750 liters, 200 gallons, each. Structures away from residential areas included potteries and smelting kilns. Various materials were used in Urartian construction, including large Cyclopean stone blocks without mortar, worked stone blocks, and mud bricks. Roofing was achieved using wooden beams or barrel vaults made of adobe bricks. The floors of prestigious buildings were often made of stone, with large basalt slabs or polychrome mosaics with geometric designs. Interior walls were adorned with frescoes, and decorative bronze plaques or cut stone slabs in red, white, or black were sometimes placed in cavities cut into the walls. Doors were crafted from thick planks of wood and secured with hinged bronze latches. The material culture of Urartu provides abundant evidence of the kingdom's wealth and prosperity. Among the surviving artifacts, pottery, objects used for religious dedications, and examples of bronze working stand out. Although large-scale stone sculptures are scarce and mostly fragmented, excavations have revealed both public and private buildings in Urartian cities adorned with interior wall paintings. These paintings, done on plaster, depict various scenes, including animals, mythical creatures, processions of gods, and everyday activities such as agriculture and hunting. The typical colors used are black for outlines, while blue and red are commonly found as well, with white backgrounds. Metalworking was a significant craft in Urartu, dating back to the 10th century BCE. Skilled artisans produced a variety of goods in bronze and copper, such as jewelry, horse bits, helmets, buckles, and candelabra. Bronze cauldrons featuring animal or human heads around the rim were also a popular product. These metal goods were often decorated using various techniques, including casting, embossing, inlaying with gold, or etching with intricate designs. One of the most prominent aspects of Urartian art is the bronze sculptures made in the round. These sculptures show an influence from Assyrian art, especially in the choice of subjects, which often include lions, 
bulls, mythological creatures like griffins and centaurs, and military themes, particularly horse riders. Religious art includes bronze figurines of important gods like Haldi, Teshiba, and Shivani. Some deities depicted in art remain unidentified, such as a female goddess made of bone and hybrid figures like fishmen, birdmen, and scorpion men. Royal household items are often identified by inscriptions, and these inscriptions have also helped identify Urartian works found in regions outside of Asia, including Etruscan tombs in central Italy. Additionally, other materials, such as ivory, semi-precious stones, and stag horns, were used in Urartian art. Regarding writing, early Urartu used simple pictograms, but they later adopted and adapted cuneiform writing from the neighboring contemporary Mesopotamian cultures. Cuneiform inscriptions found in the kingdom, totaling around 400 examples, indicate that the Urartian language was related to Hurrian, suggesting a common ancestral language dating back to the 3rd or 2nd millennium BCE. The decline of the Urartu kingdom occurred during the 7th century BCE in a mysterious and violent manner. Sometime between approximately 640 and 590 BCE, their cities were destroyed, leading to the collapse of their once powerful state. The kingdom had likely been weakened by prolonged conflicts with the Assyrians, and its vast territory may have become too difficult to control effectively. The exact perpetrators behind the destruction are not known for certain, but several candidates have been suggested. The Scythians and the Sumerians are among the potential culprits, as well as internal uprisings within the territories governed by the Urartu kings. The discovery of three-pronged arrowheads, typical of Scythian archers, at the ruined city of Teshibani supports the idea of Scythian involvement. The city's sudden destruction by fire, sometime between 594 and 590 BCE, appeared to have caught the inhabitants by surprise. Granaries were found recently filled, and weapons and precious belongings were seemingly abandoned hastily. It is likely that the downfall of the various cities within the Urartu kingdom occurred at different times, and different peoples may have been involved in the destruction over a span of two or three decades. Following the collapse of Urartu, the Medes gradually took over the territories from around 585 BCE onwards. Eventually, these regions were incorporated into the Achaemenid Empire under the rule of Cyrus the Great in the mid-6th century BCE. Despite the kingdom's demise, the Urartian language survived into the Hellenistic period. Many of the former Urartian towns remained significant settlements throughout antiquity, and some of their names have endured to this day. However, as the knowledge of Urartu was not recorded or known to ancient Greek historians, it was not until the 19th century CE archaeological excavations that the importance of this regional Bronze Age culture was recognized.